hear from Rachel Larimore, who's joining us from Michigan, where she is the Director of Education at the Chippewa Nature Center. This is one of the largest private nonprofit nature centers in the U.S. Um, they operate a visitor center that has exhibits, um, they have wildlife viewing areas, recreational trails, and a nature preschool on 1,200 acres. Uh, given that backdrop, we could certainly have Rachel speak on any number of intriguing topics, but we've invited her today to focus on developmentally appropriate practices for early childhood nature play programs. So Rachel, I'm going to, um, I think you have the magic screen wand already, so you can advance the slides, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Daddy. So hello, everyone. Um, webinars are always an interesting thing for um, an interpreter, just like I'm sure you're all well aware, because we tend to be very animated and talk with our hands and want feedback from our audience and eye contact, and we don't get any of that with a webinar. <laughs> so I do encourage you to use the chat message. So at least I know there's folks out there, even if it's a, you know, amen, right on, or or Z's that you're sleeping. Something that <laughs> makes me know you're there, that's helpful for me. Um, as Nettie said, I'm the Education Director at Chippewa um, Nature Center in Midland, Michigan. I should have put my little map up here of Michigan, but we're about halfway up um, the lower peninsula, so we don't ever want to forget about the upper peninsula. Um, there's a little more information you can find about me there, but we've talked plenty about me. Um, the goal for today is really to talk about um, ideas for you all um, for integrating nature into your informal programming. Um, some of you, it sounds like, have some preschool, so a little more formal programming already happening, but um, in a moment I'll talk about sort of the continuum of nature-based early childhood, um, and hopefully there will be something today for everyone along that continuum. The big part of the day, of this next hour, we'll talk about typical development stages, and I'm going to kind of broadly go through those because we could spend an hour on each each developmental level. Um, heck, we could spend an hour just on physical development of infants. Um, so it's going to be pretty broad. And then we'll get into do's and don'ts, um, sort of the tips and tricks, if you will. Um, some of these things you may already know and be doing, and that's wonderful, um, but hopefully there's something that's um, new and different, or at least makes you think about what you do and may um, at least make you realize, oh, there's intentionality in what we're already doing. There's a reason we do that. Um, so that's the plan for the next hour. As Nettie said, we'll have two spots for questions. About midway through, I'll stop um, and take questions. So if you have them as we go along, just type them into the chat box and Nettie's going to keep track of those for us. And then we'll have another spot at the very end. So, so that's the plan for the next hour. So with that, briefly, I don't want to spend much time on this at all because you all, um, I'm sure, are very familiar, but it's important to remind ourselves of why are we having this discussion about kids and nature in the first place. First of all, we know that nature is nece necessary for healthy development, for whole child development. That includes a physical development. Um, we know that kids who play in natural play areas have been shown to have better balance and coordination than those who are in traditional playground equipment structures. Um, we also know a study just came out of University of Washington that outdoor play has more opportunities for active play than indoor play. Um, sort of intuitive, but we're now you know, having to put some empirical evidence behind um, our thoughts and needs for getting kids outside. We know they're more active. We know um, that people who have views of nature recover more quickly from illness. Um, even hospitals now are designing the hospital so that there's a view of nature um, because those patients actually heal more quickly than those who don't have a view of nature. We also know that there's now research coming out that it prevents nearsightedness, which is myopia. Um, so just exposure to the outdoors, you know, in, in preventing nearsightedness among our kids. So that's the physical benefits. We also know there's cognitive benefits, engaging all of their senses, um, creative thinking and problem solving as an individual, um, and then of course, um, and better concentration, but of course there's also problem solving with other people. Um, and that's where we get into the social emotional interacting with their peers, 
Um, we know there's evidence now that kids with exposure to nature or even nature nearby, which is within a mile, um, actually are able to handle life stressors better than those who don't have exposure to nature. So most of this is probably refresher for everyone, but just like to remind us of why we're having this conversation in the first place. Um, and the other reason for most of us is our missions are of course to build um, lifelong stewards. So that's yet another reason, maybe for most of us even the most important reason to do all of this. So first, before we get into all the, the nitty gritties, um, I want to frame this discussion a little bit, talking about nature-based early childhood education. Sort of a newer phrase that's been used more in the last few years, um, especially as nature preschools and forest kindergartens grow. And what does that mean? It's really, for me, it's the blending of two different dif disciplines, and that's early childhood education, which has a primary goal of child development. Um, whether that's kindergarten readiness or simply physical development, social, emotional, and cognitive development. Um, how people label that is different, but the ultimate goal is some, something related to child development. Um, then the second discipline is environmental education, which for the most part has the goal of environmental sustainability, environmental literacy, um, again, how you how we label that is slightly different, but the intent is the same. And for me, where nature-based early childhood education occurs is in the overlap of these two disciplines. Um, and right in the middle of that overlap is nature-based preschools, where you have a licensed, high-quality early childhood program that is also fully integrating environmental education into their day-to-day -day operation. Now, not everyone has a nature-based preschool. Not everyone can or ever will, and that's okay. Um, if we think of that, though, as the center point, then you can also think that there's a continuum of each discipline to get to that point. So with child development, there may, or on the early childhood side of things, um, there may be a program that has a little bit of a natural play area that they go out to once a day like they would any other playground. Um, but then moving along the continuum, you might get to a full-blown nature-based preschool. So if we look at the environmental education side of the continuum, so let me, I'll go back very briefly here. Um, I think I can highlight here <laughs> this technology. So if we look at this continuum right here on the right side, um, it's kind of weird to go right to left, but hopefully you're following with me here. Um, if we think about that as informal or the environmental ed side, I think about those that have no early childhood programming at all. And there are still programs or organizations out there that don't. Um, and some of that is the little ones are intimidating. <laughs> I get that, um, especially for folks who have worked with adults all their lives. Um, so there are some programs that don't have any early childhood. More likely are programs that have periodic programs, periodic caregiver and TOT programs. So um, these tend to be once or twice a month, and there are a couple hours in length where a caregiver and the child come together for story hour and activities and crafts. And that, I would say, is the bulk of what most informal programming is related to, or some version of that. Some programs have exhibits that are specific to early childhood. Um, a lot of times they're adult exhibits with a little bit of early childhood um, geared activities, but some programs have done more with exhibits as well. Some organizations have even gone to having a public natural play area where kids can come and play as though they were out in the woods in a designated space. Um, then there's other programs that are moving along the continuum that host um, forest school visits. So forest school is an idea that came out of the UK where, which for a lot of us is field trips, right, but more regular visits. So a field trip of school might come once throughout a school year. Um, but with the forest school idea, the same preschool might come three or four times with the same um, staff member and visiting the same locations and really building a relationship with your organization and with the natural elements over time. Um, and then, of course, there's the, nat the nature-based preschool where both have been fully integrated into the program. So if you think about what are the elements we're talking about here as we move along this continuum, 
really talking about how often do you see these kids. Um, if it's once or twice a year, that's different than every day or even seasonally, quarterly. Um, how long are they staying there? You know, are they there for half an hour or are they staying for three or four hours at a time? Um, and then is there a staff person? Is there a personal contact with a staff person or is it a non-personal exhibit, so forth? So hopefully that gives you an idea of the continuum. But with this, all of these things, hopefully, are developmentally appropriate. And so I want to talk about what does that mean? Because you hear that phrase a lot, but what does that really mean? First of all, let me clarify that early childhood education, when we talk about that, we really mean birth to eight years old. That can be in a formal or informal setting either way, but it's educating the zero to eight um, population. It seems like generally when we talk about early childhood and informal programming, we tend to focus on the preschool age, the three, four, or five-year-olds, um, but it does include zero to eight, so that's important to remember that they have a similar developmental needs um, as those preschoolers, even though they may not be our, our primary audience. So developmentally appropriate practice. You hear that a lot within early childhood um, and it gets thrown around. And it's really a, a, a large term, <laughs> a very broad term, and sometimes we need to stop and say, what do we really mean by that? And really, it's the practices that promote the optimal learning um, for young children based on their development. That still is not very helpful, is it? <laughs> um, it's, it's really not. So really what we mean is it's appropriate to their age, where they typically should be developmentally at that age, but also where they actually are, what their development actually is. So this is really individualized instruction. Um, there's general activities that are going to happen in this um, time frame of life, but then every child's going to be different. It also means that it's appropriate to whatever the sociocultural context is that the child's in. So whatever their ethnicity, whatever their um, you know, community situation is, that it, it is appropriate to that and, and fits their needs. Um, you know, if they're dual language learners, um, then the practices we're going to bring into our programming is going to be a little different. Um, by the way, that's another new phrase in early childhood, rather than early or uh, English language learners in early childhood, we talk about dual language because they're actually learning two languages at once um, in this stage in life. And again, that it's appropriate for the whole child. So that means physical development, social, emotional, and cognitive. So all of those ages or all of those aspects of their development are being supported through developmentally appropriate practice. Um, this is also based on what we currently know of young children, which means developmentally appropriate practices are ever-changing constantly because the research changes. Um, what those practices include is not only the physical environment and the structure of your day and the kinds of programs you offer, but also the behavior of the teacher, so what the teacher-child interactions are. And in this case, I'm using teacher you replace that with educator, interpreter, um, but to me they're interchangeable. So I hope, hope you're willing to go along with that as well. Usually informal audiences are willing to buy that because um, <laughs> we are teachers, right? So this is a really complex phrase, developmentally appropriate practices. Um, so I'm giving you a resource here to find a little more information if you want to delve in, and every age, lim uh, age level will be slightly different, um, but it gives you a broad idea of what we mean when we say developmentally appropriate practices. So briefly, let's talk about each of these different stages within early childhood. First, there's infants and toddlers. So these are the little guys. Um, this is zero to three, and we typically break that zero to three um, range into two groups. There's the young infants, um, birth to nine, little guys seeking security, right? Somebody who's gonna respond when I cry, when I'm hungry, when I need someone to pick me up, um, meet my needs. So most of you have been around infants and you know, young infants and you know basically, they just want you to take care of them, right? <laughs> Meet their needs. So 
awfully hard to program for them, um, but we can program for their parents and them with their parents um, or caregivers. It doesn't even have to be parents. And then the next level is mobile infants. These are the ones that want to explore. So you'll notice, by the way, that there's overlap here. We say birth to nine, and then we say eight to 18. In early childhood, there's always overlap because there aren't clear, oh, you hit eight months, and now you can do X, Y, and Z. Unfortunately, it doesn't work quite that cleanly. But this is when they're going to be exploring, they're investigating everything. Everything goes in their mouth, you know, everything has to be touched. Um, they do need a trusted adult to come back to, to check in with, but they're going to be out exploring. The other thing these mobile infants will do is, what happens if I do this? If I push this toy, um, what's going to happen? And then they're going to do it again and see if the result is the same and continue to do it over and over again. Um, so sometimes you'll see kids that, you know, repeat the actions over and over, seeing if they get that same cause and effect. Now, our older toddlers, um, this is the 16 to 30 months. Sorry, I think I, or we, we divide infants into two groups and then toddlers. So I think I had said two in this group, but there's really three segments of infants and toddlers. So toddlers are our, a little bit older, um, they're physically now more mobile. More mobile. Um, they're going from the kind of wobble, I'm sure you can all picture of the toddler, to really walking confidently. Um, they're still, as even into three year and four year olds, they're still working on that balance, um, but they're they're becoming much more confident in that. Um, they're now developing their own identity, which means they want independence and control. Um, and every time I hear a, a toddler crying, I know it's because they wanted something that their way and they didn't get it. Um, because they, you know, they use a lot of mine, um, I'll do it, me do it, you know, no. Um, usually at that point they're not saying I'll, um, you know, me, mine. Um, they want to do it their way. They don't want to wear their hats. They don't want to wear their mittens. Um, <laughs> they want life to be on their terms. Um, and they're definitely, though, at this time, learning social awareness. And they're starting to become aware of interacting with other adults um, other than their parents, um, other kids, you know, really starting to notice that others are out there. Then we move into preschoolers. And this is the three and four year olds and probably the group that you all work with the most. Um, this is the time they're really curious and playful um, and imaginative. You know, the curiosity really um, amps up even more so from being a, when they're a toddler. Um, they're definitely egocentric, um, and really all early childhood <laughs> kids in early childhood are egocentric, um, and that varies as they move along. And Sometimes people hear that phrase and they think that's a negative term, and I don't mean it in any negative way whatsoever. In their world, they are, they are it. Um, they think everyone shares their same feelings. They think even inanimate objects. Um, if they're in it, then it must be about somehow related to them. Um, prime example of this, and this changes as they go from three to four-year-old. Prime example. Recently, we had a slideshow, which <laughs> was a story of the rabbit in the preschool classroom that went missing. And each child in the class was in the slideshow. And I asked the three-year-old class what the movie was about. And one of the kids said, it was about me. And he genuinely meant it was about him because his picture was in there. And he didn't even really realize that all of the other kids were in that in that slideshow, which is pretty typical. And then we asked the four-year-olds, and they knew the storyline and could tell us more of the storyline. So um, this is a big shift, even between three and four in that, in that one year, big things happen. So they move, a part of that egocentrism is they move from parallel play to interacting with their peers. So when they're three, you may have two kids that are playing side by side in the sandbox. And happy as can be, but they're not really interacting with each other, where when they get to be four, they're now actually interacting with each other and um, engaging in play together. Their physical movements are becoming much more developed um, and coordinated, um, and they're definitely getting more fine motor skills. So starting to see more writing with smaller items like crayons, you know, with a little more detail um, than just the, the whole hand grip on the markers. 
by the way, I'm in my office making motions with my hands, which I realize now you all can't see. Uh, webinars. <laughs> so anyway, um, the next level is kindergartners, and these are the five to six-year-olds. They're becoming much more sophisticated with their movement, um, can now um, hop on one leg and skip and so forth, um, and they are happy to show that, show that off whenever they can. Um, they're also getting more sophisticated in their fine motor development as well. The other thing that happens is really significant is social emotionally, um, they're now able to self-regulate, meaning they're able to control their own emotions and be patient um, and sit and wait their turn, um, raise their hand and wait their turn, where at three, that's probably beyond their um, ability for, mo for most kids. Um, so both their behaviors and their emotions that they can handle themselves, where a toddler will just break down crying when they're upset. The other thing that starts to happen at this age is more cooperative learning, where they're really learning together and engaging, even more so than just moving from parallel play to play together. Um, much more complex thinking. They can problem solve. They can reason better at this age, you know, really starting to move along in cognitive development as well. Then in primary years, those last couple of years of early childhood, this is a wide range and everyone is in a different place, um, but they're really gaining mastery of all of their do developmental domains. So physically, they're becoming much more sophisticated and can handle their bodies and do a lot more. You'll see kids swinging and jumping and climbing more at this age. Um, social emotional interactions and making friends and you know peer groups um, and then cognitive development and even more um, reasoning and math skills and reading and so forth. This is also a really important time as was all of early childhood but especially this time um, it's a really critical time for them to develop a love of learning that it isn't um, heavily academic, you know, we're, you're going to sit and do this, um, but that it still has play base, that it still is serving all of those developmental needs and, and teaching the whole child um, is, again, developmentally appropriate um, but to give them that love of learning. And then, as, as I'm saying here, they, they just need those play-based, even though sometimes we forget, right? When they're eight, it's like, man, they're, they're talking like adult, like little adults, um, but they do still need those play-based activities. So with that, um, I know I have just said a lot <laughs> that, again, could have taken hours on each part, um, but are there questions to this point? We'll give people a chance to type their questions in. Um, I'll try to capture a few of those as they come through. Go ahead and, and post them to everyone, though, so that we can see what, what people are thinking about. Um, and while we're waiting for that, um, Rachel, by the way, you're doing awesome. Uh, the fact that we can't see you is um, tricky for you, much harder for you than for us. Um, <laughs> you can see me waving my arms in my office. <laughs> it's quite entertaining. <laughs> so what, what's great is um, sort of seeing the interest in this topic despite the experience that it, people expressed at the beginning, sharing where they're coming from. Um, and I think especially in the zoo and aquarium space, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, when we were thinking, looking at the continuum that you posted, uh, I think a lot of our zoos and aquariums, um, their members are finding ways to put the, the, the centerpiece, the public natural play areas out there, as well as um, you know, many that have nature play exhibits. Um, and we're starting to see, very exciting, starting to see a few nature-based preschools that are being managed by AZA accredited zoos and aquariums. Yeah, that's um, fabulous. So, um, Dallas has a question, Dallas Sue has a question, and she asks, what extent of training is needed when working with staff that don't have the background on developmentally appropriate practice? Mm. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately it's hard to find good um, training, but I, I do think it's really important, especially anyone who has worked with other grades, even upper elementary, um, and they think, oh, I've worked with kids before. But the moment they start working with a three-year-old, um, it is different. It's very different. Um, I, you know, I was an environmental educator and worked with older kids and was comfortable there. And the idea of working with preschoolers was way outside my comfort zone. Um, 
but obviously things have changed a little bit for me. Um, it is more comfortable, and you, you have to go through that learning curve of, okay, what do I do in these programs to make it um, accessible to those kids? So I think reading up on what's appropriate for each developmental stage is really important. Um, NACI, which I will have a resource link to at the end um, is the National Association for the Education of Young Children. They have lots of good resources that are pretty short and sweet and at least would give um, general ideas to staff. Another resource that I'll list at the very end um, is a book called Natural Wonders that was written by um, Marcy Oltman um, and a group of environmental educators from Minnesota. And it's a really helpful um, simple, straightforward explanation of early childhood and environmental education um, and, and, and more tailored to informal programming. So that could be a good resource as well. But I do think training is important. Um, now a lot of, unfortunately for a lot of us, even here at the Nature Center, you know, there's a lot of times where you kind of learn on the fly, um, but the more you give staff the opportunity to learn um, through a more formal structure, that's better, I think. Um, do you think there should be a big difference between content that's created and advertised for toddler versus preschooler? Uh, not necessarily. Um, it primarily would depend on how you structure it. And as we go through this next portion, I think there are ways to have both involved, um, but it would depend on are there caregivers there? Are it, is it one or two staff that's managing a group of toddlers versus a group of preschoolers, then the programming would change. Um, if you have them there with caregivers, there are many ways that toddlers and preschools, preschoolers could be in the same group, depending on how you structure your day. Um, the attention span is going to be very different between the two groups and what they're interested in. So the toddlers, probably aren't going to be interested to sit down and do art. Um, but if you have other sensory things they can explore at the same time as the preschoolers are maybe doing a craft of some sort, um, then you could have both. So you know, that was a really broad answer. Uh, basically, it depends. <laughs> um, but let's go through some do's and don'ts, and maybe that'll help. Go ahead. I throw one more question that just came in privately yeah. um, before you move on. And that's how can you talk with parents about the lack of rigor and structure in a preschool class when they sort of have the expectation of a more formal environment for the learning? Oh, yes. Um, educating parents, especially difficult at a preschool, for those of you that are operating a, um, a licensed preschool. Parents have certain expectations of, yeah, academic rigor and readiness from an academic standpoint. Um, Interesting, if for those of you listening that would be interested in, in more on this topic, Lillian Katz has a great um, report out talking about um, um, cognitive readiness and um, experiences versus standards. And so she's done a lot of work on this. But yeah, it is important to communicate to parents what are they learning. Um, it may not look like worksheets and coloring pages, but here's how they are learning their letters. So, for example, in a little while I'm going to talk about literacy. We're, you're reading to them, um, you're having the children read back, you're having the children write, maybe you're visiting um, exhibits throughout the zoo, you know, as you go out for your hikes, and every time you read a sign, that's making language meaningful, right? Um, every time they write their name when they sign in, that's making language meaningful. So, it's noticing where those academic moments are happening and being able to communicate that to the parents. Whether that's even a poster that's, here's how we teach your kids to read, or here's how we teach math. Um, not exactly, you know, hitting them in the head, in the head with it, but sort of um, making it, making those connections a little more obvious because for some, yeah, they want to see a letter of the week and we know that that's actually not developmentally appropriate. What would be developmentally appropriate is starting with a child's name because that's, again, they're egocentric, so they care about their own name and maybe then people they know. 
um, and start with those letters. And you will hear kids all the time say that, hey, that letter's in my name. Um, they still don't know what that letter may be, but they know they can recognize it. Um, they haven't learned the label for it yet, um, but they know that it's in their name and that's important to them. So we have another section here in a minute on literacy. But first let's talk with just sort of this big idea of informal programming. What do we want to accomplish? Obviously we want to provide an environment that's developmentally appropriate. And as I said, what does that really mean? It's, it's physical environment, it's materials, and it's the adult-child interactions. So what does that look like? Well, let's see. First, it involves play, 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 play. Um, you know, Maria Montessori is famous for saying um, play is children's work. Um, play is how they express their understanding of the world. So what we do want to do, and I've broken each of these down into kind of do's and don'ts um, in these main categories. So we have power of play. We do want to encourage open-ended activities. And for anyone, you're talking about professional development for staff, for anyone who's been in other levels of programming, sometimes this is hard to just have free time for them to explore and play because we're used to structuring activities. Now we're going to play this game, then we're going to talk about it, then we're going to move on to this next activity and so forth. It doesn't really work that way in early childhood. So providing as many open-ended activities as you can. Allowing for exploration and discovery. So having stations. Um, here you see the mud kitchen. You could have pots and pans and a mud kitchen. Um, and they may create, you know, they may say, oh, I'm making cupcakes. But maybe you visited um, one of the exhibits and the zookeeper was out feeding the animals and they start you know, using that in their play, and I'm making food for the giraffe. Well, now you can see how their experiences in their life are coming into their play, and so giving them the opportunity um, to, to explore that through play. The key to doing that is providing lots of loose parts, and loose parts is a phrase that Simon Nicholson came up with. He's a landscape architect. Um, and the idea is there are materials and items that can be used in multiple ways. Um, they can be manipulated and um, played with, you know, like in this case, in this picture here, there's a muffin tin that could be a muffin tin, but it could be, um, again, brownies, muffins, cupcakes, or um, ice cubes, you know, <laughs> who knows what they may be playing with that. Loose parts can be natural or they can be man-made, either one, and both are important to have. So having buckets, having spoons, um, water, sticks, so forth, is really important for them to manipulate. And then having stations of those that they can manipulate. So you have stations of loose parts. Um, and that's a great way if you're structuring a, an hour to story hour, for example, you could have a story and then you could have stations that they're exploring and playing um, and then maybe read another story or have a craft. Um, by the way, play is so important, before I move on to this large group idea, play is so important in preschools, it's actually a measure of high quality if kids have at least 60 minutes of uninterrupted play. So you may have a two hour or an hour and a half long story hour with a group or uh, caregiver and taught, whatever you want to call them, it's okay if you have half an hour of that time that is stations. Um, now have those materials be things they might not explore at home or might, you know, maybe it's furs and skulls and other things they can manipulate that they might not experience somewhere else. Um, but a long stretch of uninterrupted time is important for them. So a don't here is don't plan a, lar a lot of large group activities. Um, keep them also limited. So you only do 10 minutes at a time, and you may do a couple small large group activities throughout the time that you have with them, but don't plan for lots of large group times. Because again, they're all in their own world and their attention span's pretty short. And they wanna go off and play. Be sure to engage all of the senses. This is really key. So include taste tests. Um, maybe you take, for example, we we were just talking about the giraffe. Um, maybe we're going to do a taste test of the things that the giraffe likes to eat versus some other animal um, on, in the zoo. And they taste which one, and then they put their name on a graph. So now you talk about you know connecting this to academics. 
Well, they maybe write their name, so they're another written their name and understanding that from a literacy standpoint, but they're also graphing, and here now we've moved into math skills as well. Um, so you can combine those, but again, it's through play. They think they're just taste testing what these animals eat and how cool is it that they got to eat the same thing that those animals got to eat. Um, exploring different textures. Again, furs and skulls and having scales, um, you know, smooth and rough skin, um, feeling the tree bark, all of those different textures are important. Um, and they will want to touch it. <laughs> There's no question they will want to touch it and give them the opportunity to. So really let them explore as much as you possibly can. The more you can say, yeah, go ahead, try that, touch that, um, smell it, you know, rub it on your cheek, the better. Um, so we always select our, like our natural history collection. We have furs and things that we know can be handled and kids can be a little rough with and it's not the end of the world. So don't use your best collection items for your preschool programs, that is for sure. Um, the other thing as a don't is don't simply just show them the artifact and then move on. Um, with adults, sometimes you can get away with that, but even adults, right, they want to touch the fur. They want to look at the skull and maybe touch its teeth. Um, so especially with this age um, in early childhood, as much as you possibly can, allow them to touch it and engage with it. So the next thing is bringing in creative arts, whatever that may be. Um, it doesn't just have to be drawing, but puppets, for example, are huge. This age, they love puppets, um, and some of that is developmentally. They think that even inanimate objects have the same feelings that they do, and this kind of comes back to that egocentrism. Um, so they will talk to a puppet and do whatever, you know, that really have empathy for that puppet, and it's amazing how they will connect more with that puppet than they would with the adult that's holding it. I want everyone to know you do not have to be a master puppeteer for this, okay? You can move your lips, you can, <laughs> I mean, just be terrible puppet, and just, you know, just move the, top, the puppet with your hand and you're good to go. They will fall in love, no question. Um, it's kind of fascinating to watch, actually. Um, so puppets are a great tool. The other thing, and also you could have a puppet, by the way, that reappears at different programs. So maybe it's the same puppet that every week, um, like we have a puppet called Harry, he's really fuzzy, um, and we, we took this idea from Joyce, um, the puppet lady, and I can never remember her last name, sorry. Um, but she would take this Harry puppet and every kind of general study time, she would dress him up in different outfits. So like when we go to study birds, he'd dress up like a bird. Um, and so you could use that with your programs where every week, depending on what you're going to explore, you know, this puppet could be wearing that outfit. Um, but you can also put googly eyes on just about anything and it will become a puppet. For example, our smoke detector is has googly eyes on it and his name is Smokey and he talks all about the fire alarm and what we're going to do for our fire drill and they're just totally fine they're like okay no worry Smokey we got it we're on it and they just love to talk to Smokey so <laughs> even googly eyes on an inanimate object becomes a puppet um, the other thing is to provide a wide variety of materials and lots of materials um, don't skimp and don't critique them when they want to use more. They will use more glue than is appropriate. There's no question. It will be soggy and covered, and that's okay. Um, so whoever's doing the budgets, you just have to remind them, this is developmentally appropriate. They are going to make a mess. They're going to waste. Um, that's okay. We'll get into the stewardship stuff later. At this point, it's them being there um, and having the experiences. So. So do allow for lots of materials. Um, and allow children to follow their inspiration. This kind of connects with the don't. Um, and that is you want to focus on what they did, but you don't want to praise. And this is especially hard when, we co when it comes to art. Um, you also don't want to create a model of the craft product. So the difference here is we're talking about product art versus pro or process art versus product art. Okay, this um, down here, let me see if I can click on this. This leaf man down here at the bottom is an example that an adult made from the book called Leaf Man. Um, we, they 
made their own leaf man. And they read the book, and we said, okay, we're going to make a leaf man. Well, in this bottom one, that is the adult version. We don't, we don't make these for the kids, and I encourage you not to make an example or a sample for the kids. You can tell them, here's the materials, and we'd like you to make your own leaf man. Then what will happen without an example is you'll get things like this and this. You'll get this creative, different view. They're deciding what a leaf man looks like, rather than trying to replicate your version. This is really important when it comes to creativity. And all too often I see coloring sheets where they're just coloring in a worksheet, which involves really no creativity whatsoever other than selecting a color. Um, but they're not mentally, they're not representing on paper their mental representation. Right, so we want to let them do that for themselves. So these upper two are what we call process art, where we're focused more on the process than we are the product or the outcome, which this would be product art down here at the bottom. So the other thing with this praise is to not praise. Um, with art especially, you'll see it. Don't you like it? Isn't it pretty? What do you think? Um, and especially kids who have been praised a lot will search for that. We, we make a really conscious effort to talk about what they did. Wow, look at all those different colors you used. Um, you use the leaf for his body. You know, you, you use the um, two different googly eyes or whatever, focus on the fact rather than praising. Because the moment you say, oh, that's a good job, that's nice, then you have to now say that to the next person, right? Or if you don't, then the next child's thinking, oh, is my art not nice? What's wrong with my art? Um, so, something to be thinking about. Um, there was a question on this about um, coloring sheets, and especially in unstaffed areas and exhibits. So that's a great, great point. Um, we tend to use coloring sheets um, for like non-personal interp moments where here's a picture of an animal that we have and then you can color it in. And I'm not saying that those are need to be banned from your organization by any means. <laughs> you know, we have those sometimes as well. But if you can bring in things like um, tracks that they can stamp or rubbing plates of different pictures of animals or tracks of animals, um, other ways that they can represent those, the animals in your zoo or in your aquarium without it actually being a coloring sheet. So you don't have to ban coloring sheets completely, um, but there, those are a couple alternatives would be the, the rubbing sheets and so forth. So we'll keep moving along here so we make sure we don't run out of time. Um, another one is music and movement. Do for sure include songs. The teacher should sing the Take portable speakers now with the wireless and Bluetooth speakers. You can take those anywhere. Um, repeat the songs and repeat them again. <laughs> they will love them. Once they find a song they love, they want to do it over and over again. And that is developmentally appropriate. It's okay if you repeat it. Um, that's appropriate for this age. And also allow them to get up and move. You know, if they want to dance, let them dance. Um, if they want to wiggle, you know, let them wiggle. Um, that, again, that's appropriate for this age. Another thing that's important about music and movement is it's a great transition tool. So let's say, for example, you're in the classroom and you want to go to the tiger exhibit. Well, on your way, you can move like a tiger. Um, you can move like any animal. Um, use that movement as a way to transition. You can also play a song as you go, especially if you have a wireless speaker, you know, and they're um, stomping like the dinosaurs or all sorts of different kids songs and you can use as a transition from one location to another and then essentially keeps them on task without having to say hey stand in a line and let's go um, again more developmentally appropriate for their age again do not expect them to sit still you'll fail <laughs> if they listen to music they're going to wiggle they're going to move and that's perfectly okay um, and back to this professional development question from earlier that's a big stretch for some people. If they haven't been working with young children, the idea that there's movement while I'm talking as the teacher is sometimes hard for folks to, to get their mind around. So um, it's important for them to understand that that is appropriate for them to move, um, that they won't be able to sit still. Be sure to bring literacy into your program. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but read to them. Um, I encourage a story with just about every program, um, lots and lots of opportunities to read. Provide opportunities for them to write. 
A simple way to do that would be have every child sign in at the beginning of a program. My guess is you have parents sign in of some sort. Have the kids do it. Um, that could be they actually scribble their name on a piece of paper, or it could be Scrabble pieces that they have to find the letters of their name and spell them. Um, so it can have or a chalkboard or the other thing we do sometimes for sign-ins is a graph where you might ask um, you know maybe there's something you visit regularly I'm trying to think of an example of um, will the I don't know will the bear be sunning himself on a rock today or not you know if it's if that's a discussion that you have every time you can have them predict that and they put their name on which side yes or no if they think it's going to happen or not so they're signing in and they're writing um, but they're really predicting as well notice and read interpretive signs along your hikes um, you know, carry a small dry, small dry erase board with you everywhere you go. So then anytime there's a big word they don't know that sounds, man, it's hard to say, you can write that on the dry erase board. You can use that for counting. Um, there's so many different ways that you can use that dry erase board. Even if they're, I mean, at this age, most, until they're five or six, they're not actually able to read it, um, but it's giving meaning to language, and that's the key at this age, is that it's purposeful and it's relevant to them, and that's really what we want to, to instill at this point. Um, all right. I think I already mentioned that they care most about the letters in their name, which is why sign-in is so important. Um, don't constantly drill them. Definitely don't do that. Um, you don't want this to be a uh, what letter is that? What's that word? How does that sound? Um, and that's important to remember in general related to anything we're doing with them is how we question. We want to have open-ended questions as much as possible um, and not just drill them on what letter is that. Um, there was something, oh, the other thing I was going to say related to literacy, an activity that we do um, that would be really fun to do at a zoo or aquarium um, is we have at sign-in, when they come in to sign-in for preschool, the first letter of their name is missing. Um, and it's just, we don't know what happened to them, but they're somewhere out on the Nature Center property, and you could do this again at your site. And then we go out on a hike and we search for those letters, and those letters we have hanging around. So. Um, on trees here, but you could have them anywhere um, and have maybe, you know, on a special page that shows that it's for a program so people won't mess with it. And then they have to, first of all, notice, right, so there's just awareness of their surroundings. Then they have to identify the letter. What letter is that? What does it sound like? Whose letter might this be? You know, is it an R, so it's Rachel, or is it an N, and it's Nettie's? You know, we can start to see that. So prior to that, you know, you'd be calling me Achel because my R is missing. Um, but then go and explore and find those letters. So that's a way to bring literacy in, in an informal way, you know, in informal programming as you're out exploring. So just something to think about. The other thing I want to say about literacy is don't be afraid to use the big words, the accurate words. As long as they understand what it is you're talking about, it's okay to use the big word. If they understand the meaning of the word, then use it. For example, if you talk about how this animal only ever me eats meat, that's all this animal eats, it's okay to say it's a carnivore. You know what we call animals that only eat meat? We call them carnivores. Um, but don't use that word without an explanation. So the explanation should come first, but then use the word. But absolutely use the, the big words. Um, it's amazing to me <laughs> at this age what language they'll get and what they'll use over and over again. Um, one of our Nature Kindergarten program parents just said the other day, yeah, at Christmas break we went on this scavenger hunt and I couldn't believe all the things I had to Google because they were talking about brumation and torpor and she's like, I've heard of hibernation but I hadn't heard of the other things. So, you know, they were able to use those words because they knew what it meant and someone had actually labeled it that way. Um, sometimes we try to dumb down language and there's no, no reason to do that. Now, probably scientific <laughs> names are, um, you know, a little harder for them, but hey, if they're willing to learn, you know, the other name we call this tiger, and then, sorry, I don't know scientific names of tigers, but then actually use its scientific name. That would be okay, too, because they love language and they want to play with it and discover it, and you want it to be fun and interesting. All right, so we also want to support other academic skills. 
I want to encourage observations and predictions and questioning. And the way to do that is to ask open-ended questions. We have to be careful. We don't want to constantly be asking questions. We want them to have time to process and think. But we do want to ask, you know, what do you think will happen if? What do you think will happen when? What do you notice about that? You know, what do you notice about this aquarium that's in front of us? You know, what do you notice about that fish swimming by? Um, you know, his eyes are on the top of his head or <laughs> whatever. You know, and you'll get all sorts of answers. Um, but so that they start to make the observations and they start to do the noticing. You know, do include math, as I've already talked about, having counting, graphing. The photo here is an example of we had talked about insects with these kids. And so this was a pile of loose parts where it was just sticks and acorns and leaves. And we said, hey, make an insect. And so they made an insect. And yeah, they used more than, well, actually here he had six legs, um, probably had more than three body parts. But that's okay if they use 12, you know, get them to count it and talk about it and then notice, oh, look, yours has wings and theirs doesn't have wings um, and do those comparisons. And again, this is coming back to play. So now we're supporting academic learning through counting, but we're also playing through loose parts. I've already mentioned this a couple times, but don't inundate them with questions, especially the close-ended questions. Those are particularly annoying. <laughs> what color is that? What letter is that? Um, you know, what shape is that? This this isn't a college entry exam, right? They don't need to pass all of those, answer all of those questions to pass to the next level. Um, so give them an opportunity to breathe. Ask them some open-ended questions. And a way to, if you want to know if they know their colors, a way to do that is simple things like, hey, pass me the green truck versus the red truck, um, right? And then you'll know if they know the difference. Um, or you can then ask them, oh, is that the green truck? Oh, no, I meant to pass you the other one, right? So use it sparingly and appropriately. All right, big one that people talk about a lot is behavior management because they're squirmy and they're all over and, oh, how do we keep them on task? The big thing is to focus on keeping everyone safe. And we use that language a lot with the kids. We need to keep ourselves and other people safe. And so if they're doing something that isn't safe, then we'll say that. Like, oh, what you're doing is, isn't safe. It might hurt your friends. It might hurt me. It might hurt yourself. So here is what I want you to do. Tell them what you want them to do. So rather than saying don't run, say, hey, walk. Be sure to walk or walk simply. You know, especially if they're um, younger and struggling with directions. One word is perfectly fine. Say it in a positive way, you know, a, a kind of a positive tone in your voice, but a, a voice that also um, expects results. So don't say it with a question mark at the end. Don't say walk. Um, don't yell walk, Arr! you know, but just walk. Straight and matter of fact. Um, and tell them what you do want them to do. Use their names as much as possible, which is especially difficult in our programs um, when it's not a preschool, you know, when you just have drop-in kids that may not come, not be the same kids every week, you know, they may not come regularly. So having name tags is important so you at least have a starting point of what their name is. Because um, otherwise, at least if you're like me, I'll never remember. But it is more useful to know their name. Offer positive choices as much as you possibly can. Don't ever offer a choice of things you don't want to do um, or, or aren't really options, but offer, you know, would you like to carry the bucket or the net? Because you want them to carry something, and now they have a choice of which one they would, you would like them to do. Um, but the more choices they have, the better. Even if you're handing them a marker, if they say, hand me a marker, say, would you like the red one or the green one? Now we've now talked about colors, and we've given them a choice in the same sentence, which is fabulous. <laughs> With behavior management, don't give long-winded instructions. Again, the shorter the, the better, even if it's one word. Um, and you definitely don't want multiple step instructions. Two steps um, at three and four is okay. We start getting into three steps, that's a little much. So take your shoes off, wash your hands, and set the table is probably more than they can handle. But take your shoes off, wash your hands, they can probably handle it three and four. So just be aware of where they're at. Um, and keeping your instructions short and simple. And so not the other don't is not saying no and stop all the time. Again, focusing on what you want them to do. Um, when we 
focus on what we want them to do, it's a whole lot more pleasant for everyone. If it's a constant nagging, then it's not really enjoyable for anyone to be there. Um, and part of that is don't require them to be sitting for long stretches. Don't require them to have all eyes on you. Even a kid who's looking somewhere else and is standing there, great. They're there with the group, no big deal that they're not looking at you. Um, you know, keep moving forward. So the other thing with um, any informal programming is, of course, engaging the caregiver, caregivers. You know, encourage the children and adults to play together. Give adults clear tasks of what you want them to do. <laughs> so again, not what you don't want them to do, but here's what I do want you to do. Um, and a big thing with don't is don't talk to parents as, or any adult as though the children aren't present. Sometimes some parents have struggles with that for whatever reason. Um, they want to talk about their own child. They want to talk about someone else's child. They just want to chat about the football game. Um, and remember that the kids are there, and so whatever the topics are need to be appropriate. Um, and even though we're taller than them, we shouldn't really be talking above them, right, that we should be engaging the kids as much as possible. So with that, I'm right up to the end here, <laughs> but are there questions? Um, I, there was a question about alternatives to coloring sheets. I think we answered that. Nettie, have you gotten other questions? No, none other that came through just to me. We can take um, you know, 10 seconds and see if anything <laughs> comes in here, but we are bumping up against the top of the hour, and I know everyone has other things to do, and this webinar system actually needs to be used for another program. Um, yeah. So, Rachel, thank you so much for being part of the ACA Nature Play program, and thanks for everyone who found time today to log on and participate. And I know whether you're launching a Nature Play program or just going to get a refresher and pick up a few new nuggets, I hope that this was really valuable for you. Um, this program was made possible through the support of Disney's Conservation <laughs> Fund, and ACA is going to be hosting two more free webinars on Nature Play one in February and one in March. Um, so you can look for um, information about that. Um, many of you have already registered for those. And I think at this point it is time to power down and go play outside. So cheers, everyone. There's uh, one more slide up on your screen that gives you a couple more resources and um, Rachel's email address, contact information. This will be made available um, for everyone after the fact as well. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.